In February 2015, the Institute for Regulation and Risk invited prominent central bankers from the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank to London to talk about the future of the global economy. That night, I talked with the author and investment strategist, Dr George Cooper, and we agreed that central bankers were, at best, complacent. In his most recent book, Money, Blood and Revolution, George claims that economics is a broken science, but a broken science that can be fixed. When we met again, I started by asking him about that central banker's dinner, and more importantly, where from here for the no longer dismal, but now broken science? I found the dinner very frustrating, actually. You know, there there was a panel of experts and a few expert speakers, but there was nothing that I felt was said there that wouldn't have been said before the 2008 crisis. There was no new thinking. There was no evidence that people had looked at the problems that caused the crisis and changed their views in any way. Central bankers think that they can persistently backstop the economy. They think that ultimately they are the masters of the universe. Do you agree? I wrote a book about this a few years ago. I think actually the central bankers are really a big part of the problem here. If you look in uh, particularly in engineering, there's an idea called control system theory, uh, which comes, comes from a very famous physicist called James Clerk Maxwell. And what he showed was if you've got an unstable system and you try to over-control it, you can actually drive it uh, even further out of control. And I think this is what the central banks have done. Uh, they, they've got a mindset which comes from their economic theories that the economy is a naturally self-stabilizing system. So that's led them into this strange, confused situation where whenever we get a little recession, they try to pump money into the system to try and get us out of that recession. In order to do that, they encourage even more debt in the economy and don't recognize that it's the debt itself that often causes the recession. So by fixing today's little recession with more debt, they inevitably create a bigger future recession. And what we have done over the last really 20 or 30 years is the the central banks have continually tried to micromanage our economy, tried to keep growth um, permanently high by pushing more and more debt into society with the result that they've created an ever more fragile economy, one that's much more crisis prone, much more prone to asset bubbles, and much more, unfortunately, a much more polarized society as well, because the more debt you have in society, the more interest rate payments are suffered. Actually, when you dig into economic theory, you find that for the most part, debt isn't in there at all. So if debt isn't there, There's also no appreciation of the different interest rates that people pay on debt. And the fact that that's missing is a a real problem because, of course, if a society is very indebted, that usually means that people at the bottom of society are in debt to those at the top, and the people at the bottom are paying very high interest rates, and the people at the top are not. So this causes a flow of wealth up what I call the social pyramid. We see that payday lenders or predatory lenders are charging 5,000% APR as an interest rate and central banks are lending to other banks, um, private banks, uh, you know, a percent, let's say hypothetically a, a percentage point. That innate inequality uh, has a social ramification, it has a social effect. Why are central bankers so incredibly reluctant to talk about this? Um. The mindset of the central banker is drawn, in my view, directly from neoclassical economics, from Chicago School economics. And that school of economics has become really enamoured with this idea of trickle-down economics. That phrase itself has actually gone out of fashion a bit. It's now trickle through economics. Oh, really, rebranded. Well. But um, but the mindset is still there, and the mindset is that. The only way to create economic growth is to make sure that those at the top of society are extremely rich and then the wealth will trickle down from them. Um, 
This is still the mindset of the central bankers. That's what the quantitative easing is about. Uh, I think it's wrong. I don't think that's the way the economy works. But that's, I think, the, the background problem here. You have recently, uh, in your, your most recent book, uh, Money, Blood and Revolution, uh, in the book you thank your daughters for the inspiration to write it. When they asked you what they should study at school and they then suggested economics, uh, and that might be interesting, you replied, don't do economics because, and I quote, it will only lead you to think about the world in the wrong way. Um, that's right, actually. Uh, it was funny. What triggered me writing that book was an event where I was sitting on the sofa with my two daughters. We were watching the BBC News and it, the education secretary came on. I think it was David Willits at the time. And he announced that they were increasing university tuition fees from 3,000 to 9,000 pounds a year. At which point I, uh, unfortunately, I swore rather violently. Um, and uh, my daughters asked me what I thought was so wrong about that policy. Uh, that then led into a conversation about what they should study at university. Uh, we went through the different subjects and at one point I said to them, uh, economics is the only one that I wouldn't be willing to support them in doing. I said I'll pay your fees for any other subject apart from economics. Um, and then they said to me, Daddy, what's wrong with economics? And of course, I couldn't answer that uh, in a in a in a soundbite. Um, so I I decided I would write the book for them to explain what was wrong with economics. Economics is a broken science. Let's pick that up. Um, you've also said it's kind of living in an Alice in Wonderland state, uh, believing in multiple inconsistent things at the same time. What do you mean by that? When you look at any given economic problem, you can invariably find a respected economist to support almost any given opinion. You can, you can pick out of the group of economists lots and lots of different conflicting ideas. Should we be putting taxes up? Should we be putting taxes down? Should we allow interest rates uh, to be managed by central banks? Should we allow exchange rates to move around on their own? Or should we peg currencies? Things like that. The Greek problem at the moment. Should Greece default? on its debt and leave the euro, or should it carry on in the austerity program that it's in? You can find respected, sensible people that will support violently different views. And that's symptomatic, in my view, of a science that's in crisis or a field of study that's in crisis. Uh, and by that I mean there isn't a body of knowledge in economics that is uh, sufficiently accepted to be useful. And by useful, I mean useful to policymakers so that they can work out sensible policies. The economics as a field is not providing useful guidance to our policymakers because it's offering so many conflicting views. But quite specifically, you say it's in a scientific crisis. Yes. Which brings us to the thorny issue, is economics a science? Ah, I find myself in a tiny, tiny minority of people on this subject. I think economics isn't a science but I think economics could be a science and and the reason that's a very minority view is economists tend to think it already is a science and laymen sort of laugh at it and think it never could be a science. Is economics an art? Um, right now no it's not it's more a, I, I see economics right now as more akin to something like astrology it's not an art it's a um, it's just a body of very confused ideas. I wouldn't elevate it to the, to the heights of an art. Someone recently said that uh, actually economics is the only uh, discipline, if you like, that makes astrology seem credible. And when I talk in astrology in that sense, I mean horoscopes. Um, actually, I think it is, it's very, very analogous to, uh, to astrology. Um, and I think we could go through a very similar development to what happened with astrology. Uh, astrology is essentially um, pre-Copernican astronomy. It's, it's derived directly from uh, the way we used to do astronomy before the Copernican scientific revolution. There were some ideas in there that were reasonable, but basically it was, it was nonsense and you needed somebody to sort those ideas out. 
I think economics is like that at the moment. There are some nuggets of valuable ideas in in the field, but we really need to reorganize it into a proper scientific discipline. One of the things that people agree on universally about your book is the narrative style. And um, just talking to you, you are passionate about story. You also talk about a man uh, who's a scientist and philosopher, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, who was he? Thomas Kuhn's a fascinating uh, character. He started as a physicist um, and then became uh, basically a, an historian of science. He studied scientific revolutions through history, particularly the Copernican Revolution. And from that, uh, he then developed into a philosopher of science, uh, or as I call him, a scientist of science. He studied how science works. And he developed this really fascinating idea that, uh, that science is not the process that we're all taught in school. It's not a, it's not a process of making experiments, testing data, uh, testing theories against data. It's more a process of telling ourselves stories that fit the data uh, and, um, surprisingly, often interpreting the data in order to fit the story. And his great insight was that it's the story that controls the way we think and the way we observe the data. And this is where I think economics has gone wrong. We've told ourselves a story of general equilibrium, that the economy automatically stabilizes itself. Uh, we've told ourselves a story that humans make decisions independently of each other. We've told ourselves a story that we're all rational optimizers. We're all trying to get as rich as possible. And those stories have led to this body of economic theory, which is just patently nonsense when you look at the way societies really work. We don't behave independently of one another. Humans are one of the most social herding animals that there is on the planet, I think. We clearly make decisions in groups. We move around in groups. We're subject to, to fads and fashions in our opinions and also in our economic activity. So we've told ourselves the wrong story for economics. This is probably a decent time to bring in um, Mr. Charles Darwin because you also cite him and you use him in a sense to, to explain economics. Uh, can you just talk a little bit around uh, Charles Darwin's entry into this story? Yes. I think there's a very simple way to bring Darwinian ideas into economics and I think by doing that we clear up a lot of the confusion in economics. Um, so, as I said, the neoclassical view of the way we behave is we're all trying to get as rich as possible. So no matter how rich we are, we're still trying to get richer and richer and richer. And the neoclassical view, that's the prevailing economic ideology at the moment. That's correct. In the West, to call it that glibly. Yes, that is the, the prevailing ideology or prevailing dogma. And that is, just to clarify, that is also the dogma ideology that is taught by almost all, in fact, all Ivy League universities. That's right. So what I say in my book is, let's just change that dynamic slightly. Let's accept Darwin's idea that we've evolved to be competitors. So let's say we're not trying to maximize our wealth, but rather we're doing something that in, in some ways is a little darker. We're trying to get richer than each other, um, which appears at first to be almost equivalent, but it's not. There's a subtle difference. If we're trying to get richer than each other, what this means is that when you're at the very top of the social pyramid and there's nobody ahead of you, it means that perhaps you change your focus. You're not trying to get wealthier anymore because you are the most wealthy. Instead, you turn your focus around and you're more interested in making sure that nobody catches up with you. Uh, so. If we take that, uh, that small twist to the theory and you say we're Darwinian competitors rather than neoclassical optimizers, then it's only a small leap to get from there to realize that perhaps the natural human economic system is actually a feudal system where 
once the society has polarized into a small leadership group and the rest, that leadership group will do everything it can to maintain the status quo, to maintain a static society. And I would argue that actually that, that uh, sort of basically a feudal system or a monarchy system, that's the system that best explains 95, maybe 99% of human history, not the idea of neoclassical economics that actually we're generating growth all the time naturally. Neoclassical economics, in my view, has got a problem. The problem is it can't explain why 99% of human history has been dominated by no growth at all. And it can't then explain why suddenly somebody flicked a switch on a few hundred years ago and the economy started growing. It's also a loss to explain the fact that 99% of the people don't own all of the wealth and 1% do. Does neoclassical economics uh, have uh, blood in its hands for creating that kind of system? I think neoclassical economics, it can't explain wealth polarization. It, actually, neoclassical economics, it's, it's almost comical. It breaks the whole economy down into a system that's represented by essentially just one person. It's, it doesn't have the idea of human interaction or, or social division or hierarchy. Or as, I, as I put recently, you know, economies are about human interaction. Economics is about ignoring human interaction. <laughs> I mean, I literally couldn't write it. Could you? It, it, really, it really is almost that simple. What, what economists have done is they have stripped all of the important aspects of, uh, of real economies out of their theories and produced this bizarre model that operates as though there were only one person in the economy. Why have they done that? Um, it's, a, it's very easy to build a, a sort of conspiracy theory around it. I don't think there's any conspiracy theory. I think what's happened is they have just taken a lazy path. They've taken the path of least resistance. And, and actually, I, I, I think if we look at it historically, we can see why they've taken that lazy path. Ar around uh, the end of the 19th century, physics was making huge breakthroughs. There there were new ideas of physics, uh, statistical theories of physics, which were leading that science to really emerge uh, triumphant amongst almost all bodies of knowledge um, at the time. And I think economists basically looked at the mathematical uh, models of physics, things like conservation laws, like statistical laws, and they decided that they would borrow those laws and apply them to uh, to economics. So if you like a conservation principle in physics is is like the efficient markets idea. There's no losses in the system. The general equilibrium theory is drawn directly from physics analogies. And the idea that you can distill human behavior into just an optimizing uh, almost particle um, is again to try to use the, the physics, uh, the language of physics. So I, I think they've they've just misunderstood the system. They've used the wrong metaphor. In fact, in in my book, I argue that a better paradigm to base economics on is, funnily enough, a medical paradigm rather than a physical paradigm. In the book, you say that William Harvey, doctor to uh, King Charles I. Uh, was the first man to understand blood flow and the workings of the human heart. Just talk me through that. Um, yes, it, it's, a, it's a great story, William Harvey's breakthrough. Before William Harvey, uh, the, the medical profession was completely dominated by an ancient Greek theory, which was known as the equilibrium of the humors. And part of that theory was that there was two blood systems. There was the... Uh, the the dark red blood and the and the oxygenated bright red blood and one flowed through uh, the arterial system and one flowed through the venous system but they both flowed in basically the same direction they flowed very slowly they they they, they seeped rather than flowed 
Uh, and that theory dominated the world for, for thousands of years and was part of the reason that doctors used to do bloodletting and put leeches on people and things like that. Um, Harvey came along, did some very interesting dissections um, and did some very simple experiments as well where he, um, he placed a tourniquet around one of his servant's arms and noted that the way the blood appeared to be backing up in the veins uh, indicated that the blood was really flowing in the opposite direction to that required of Gallen's theory. And that tiny little insight, just realizing the blood in the veins was going the opposite way, that led him to realize that the blood in the body actually works in a circulatory flow. It, if you like, it flows out through the, through the arteries and then flows back through the veins. So he, he made that little breakthrough, and from that, we basically have scientific medicine as a result. And it's such a well, seemingly innocuous breakthrough, but it creates such a huge shift in a field. At the moment, what we've got is a frozen conflict in economics, because the neoclassical school, and then you have the Austrian school, the tribalism between these different schools of thought. Yes, and, and this, this is again a key part of what I, what I put in the book. This is part of Thomas Kuhn's theory of scientific crises. He says when a, when a field is in a crisis, it degenerates into a very acrimonious tribal war, which is exactly what we've got in, in economics. We've got, we've got, for example, the Marxists competing with the neoclassical school, so the left wing, the right wing. In the middle, we've got the Keynesians. Then we've got the monetarists, which I think is the most confused of all schools. <laughs> and then we've got the Austrians. Uh, we've got Minsky's ideas. And then sitting outside of that, we've, we've also got the institutionalists and the behavioral schools of economics. All of these different ideas, they're all sort of at war with each other. Uh, and what Kuhn explained was the way to move forward is to cherry pick the best ideas from each of those schools and then put them together in a really simple story that lets you think about the good ideas working together rather than fighting against each other. What's the likelihood of that kind of renaissance taking place today? Because what we see as we sit here is an increasingly fractious international dialogue. We see levels of confusion are greater than, than ever. What could be a catalyst to start a uh, conversation that isn't fundamentally driven uh, as the last 50 years have been on, on combat and conflict? Well, actually, I think there is a very simple way to resolve a lot of those, those conflicts. Now, let's, let's take the two most extreme e examples, if you like, the neoclassical economics, Adam Smith's School of Economics versus Karl Marx's School of Economics. What, what's the real essence of those two schools? Adam Smith is that economic progress is created by the individual pursuit of self-interest. Let's, let's put a tick in that box. That's and fair say, enough, though, isn't it? Yes, let's put a tick in that box and say we can agree with that. What's Karl Marx's big beef with that? Well, he says that capitalism is basically a wealth-polarizing machine. It leads to wealth flowing up the social pyramid, concentrating into the hands of a few people, and then the economy stalls and falls over as a result. We, we can put a pretty big tick in that box as well. So if we've got those two ideas, all we need really is a very simple idea that connects those two together and lets you agree with Adam Smith and agree with Karl Marx. The breakthrough is very simple. Let's accept that capitalism does push wealth up the social pyramid, and climbing up the social pyramid is what creates the economic progress. But then let's also accept that progressive taxation, the state sector, is necessary to recirculate that wealth back down to the bottom of the social pyramid, which helps create the spending and helps generate economic activity. So we get very simply from that an idea of what I call a circulatory growth model. There's a circuit of wealth powered both by capitalism on one side, the state sector on the other side. And this keeps us a little bit like hamsters on the treadmill, the hedonic treadmill, where we're constantly 
uh, driven to uh, create economic activity and create progress by this circulatory flow. We want to get ahead, but once we are ahead, we've got to keep running, otherwise the tax man takes the money off us. So that's what creates the, um, the economic activity. And when we start looking at it in that very simple circulatory way, we can agree with Karl Marx, we can agree with Adam Smith, and when you dig into the details, you find you can agree with Keynes and you can agree with the Austrian School of Economics. You can also agree with the institutional school because the institutional school has to be drawn into this because we only created that circulatory flow when we established democracies with progressive taxation. And interestingly, that's only when we started economic growth. We only started it after the, the revolutions in England, America and France. And that was, that was the real breakthrough. So this very simple circulatory idea, bringing democracy and progressive taxation in, lets us have a simple theory that agrees with all of these warring schools at the moment. But it also fits the history of humanity. It, it fits with why growth started in, in Europe and North America only a few hundred years ago, and only in that particular region. If you begin to talk like this, and, and, and let's be utopian for a minute, let's say you get broad agreement, where from here, what would you start to see if you started to re-implement, if you like, progressive taxation? If you started to say that the system isn't just about you know, incessant privatisation, it isn't just about Marx, it isn't just about Adam Smith. Actually, there's a pluralistic approach here. And if we cherry pick the best ideas and we, we then put those ideas together, where do we go with that? Well, actually, it's very easy to see a simple story like that, a new paradigm, can lead you to, I think, almost straight away to better policies. It becomes very easy, for example, to understand why it's problematic to keep encouraging more and more debt in society. Because with that circulatory model, what you need is a balance between essentially the the force of the private sector which causes wealth to flow up the pyramid against the public sector which redistributes it back down to the bottom of the pyramid. If you superimpose on top of that structure a very high level of debt with those at the bottom paying very high interest rates to those at the top, then you've, you've strengthened one half of that circuit. As the analogy I use is we should be thinking of these as like the biceps and the triceps. They need to be in opposition with each other, but they need to be balanced with each other. Debt changes the balance. So perversely, the more indebted your economy is, the more taxation you need to keep the system running. And that's not the way we've gone. We've encouraged the debt. We haven't rebalanced on the other side. And that's why economic activities slowed down and why society is more polarized. The first easy gain is we look at this model and we say we have to stop encouraging excessive debt in society. Why does the neoclassical economic school not recognise debt, private debt? Um, the neoclassical school just doesn't have debt in the, in the model at all. But um, why? <laughs> well, I've been scratching my, my head about that uh, for a long time. They, they, just, they don't have an understanding of the whole concept of credit. Um, I think it, I'm going to be generous and say it's just because they wanted to simplify their model so they could make some progress, but they've simplified to the point where they've taken out the important element of, of the economy. Allow me not to be so generous. Is it because a lot of economists, mainstream economists, are, are employed by banks and therefore don't see debt because their salary depends on them not understanding it? Um, I think there's a fair degree of that, to be, to be fair. Um, but of course, this is, this is hugely problematic because economists that study uh, theories that tell them to ignore debt are also the people that we put in charge of both the private sector banks and also the central banks. So we, we train the people that run the central banks and run monetary policy in theories that are designed to teach them exactly how not 
to do their job. It's a very perverse situation. Which brings us back to the reason you advised your daughters not to pursue a uh, education and economics because it'll lead you to think about the world in the wrong way. Absolutely. As it's currently taught. As it's currently taught. Uh, that said, I, you know, I do want to inject an optimistic note. I, I actually think economics really could make a transition towards becoming scientific. And I know that sounds like a huge leap at this point, but again, I would say think about where medicine was before William Harvey. Think about where astronomy was before Copernicus. They were both uh, really fields dominated by superstition and nonsense. And yet, with very simple ideas, they emerged to become mature sciences. I think economics can make that leap. It's never going to be a clockwork science like physics, but it could be a uh, um, a complex science like medicine or meteorology or geology. Will it make that leap? Um, I think it will. History suggests that these confused fields do eventually uh, become resolved, but history has warnings in it. It took a couple of thousand years to, to fix uh, astronomy, and even after... Uh, the, the first correct ideas were put forward uh, by the Greeks. They were ignored for 2,000 years. The, we've had this problem going on in economics for realistically probably 100, 150 years. Um, I think it does feel like it's coming to a head. So I'm, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic and say I think we will make the breakthrough in the next, in the next few decades. A lot of the people who, maybe in your position, back in the day, were burnt at the stake, hung, drawn, quartered, because they wanted to get rid of the, those ideas. Worried, George? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would say yes. I've had a fair amount of pushback on this idea. I, I find the, the response to be very interesting, actually. The layman, people who are just interested in how the economy works but haven't studied economics, they tend to find what I say in Money, Blood and Revolution to be really nothing more than a statement of the obvious. Common sense. Just common sense. The professional economists who study the theories find it um, a sacrilege, if you like. They, they become very upset by what I'm saying. Well, allow them to be upset. You must be doing something right. Um, well, I... I think if you're not uh, if you're not breaking eggs, you can't really make an omelette, can you? I think you do have to stir this up a bit. George Cooper, author, of Money, Blood, and Revolution. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.